Today is the 29th of November 1991. I'm here on the volcanic continental crack in Iceland, which divides the two continents, America and Europe. Iceland is one of the most active volcanic places on this planet. My name is Willy Knudsen, and I film the volcanoes here. My father, Oswalter, started filming the volcanoes here in 1947. As always, I'm waiting for some volcanic developments. And in the meantime, I'm going to take you on a tour of this island and show you some of the things that have been happening in Iceland the last few years. Most of the people coming to Iceland arrive at the Leif Eriksson International Airport in Keplavik. If you take the airline bus to Reykjavik, the capital, 50 kilometers away, you drive through some of the lava flows from the past eruptions. Many people coming here for the first time think they've come to the end of civilization. No trees, no houses, nothing. The capital Reykjavik is also in the volcanic zone. The population here is around 120,000, about half of the population of Iceland. All the houses are heated with hot water, pumped out of the ground and stored in big hot water tanks. I'll start my story on the 18th of August 1986, when Reykjavik was celebrating its 200-year anniversary. The longest birthday cake ever baked in Iceland was sliced and served to the town's people. I was on alert for a new crater opening by Lake Mivat in North Iceland. A huge magma chamber underneath the ground kept filling and emptying, threatening the settlement by the lake. To give you an example, in one day during the years of eruptions, the town by the lake was lifted 30 centimeter and the mountain by the town moved 2.1 meters away that same day. The latest crater opening was 10 kilometer long. The development by Lake Mivat, which started 1975, was considered by the scientists the most important geological event in Iceland this century. I have now been on daily alert for the eruption by Lake Mivat for almost 16 years. It's the very longest I have ever covered an eruption. All the volcanoes in Iceland are on the active volcanic zone. The ones I concentrate on are the Krabla volcano by Lake Mivat, Askja, Kverkfjöll, the Grimsvöll Lake, Hekla, where I was expecting something to happen, Heimai and Sutsay. In August and September 1986, there were a whole series of earthquakes all along the entire length of the volcanic crack in Iceland. In Mount Hekla in the south, there were small steam explosions. The Katla volcano underneath the Mirdalsjökull glacier last erupted in 1918 and had been overdue for a long time. There was a lake in the ice on top of the volcano that I had never seen before. Off the south shore, there were earthquakes near Elte or Fire Island. It's one of the world's largest gannet colonies. It's the home of about 50,000 gannets. As there was no lava making it to the surface anywhere, I made a wild guess and headed for the center of Iceland, for the Kverkvjöll hot spring area in the northern part of the Vatnajökull glacier or the Water glacier. 
There have been many undocumented eruptions here in the past. It's one of the most spectacular places in Iceland. I landed in the north by Lake Mivat, picked up two of my cameramen, Matthias, who's also a teacher, and Daryl, who'd been on watch in the Krapla Caldera, and we then drove south to the center of Iceland. We drove on the east side of the Jökulsá river. We were heading for the Vatnajökull glacier. It's a hundred kilometer away from the main road. It was September, there's not much traffic here this time of year. As in many places in the mountains, there's a rescue hut here. At the edge of the glacier, hot water was seeping from underneath. All of a sudden, we had word from Lake Mivatn of earthquakes originating far up in the glacier. So I decided to drive back to Lake Mivat right away and get hold of a plane. Our jeep started to leak both oil and fuel. We barely made it to the main road and hitchhiked to Lake Mivat and the Krapla Caldera. What was happening in the glacier was probably the beginning of a glacier burst, a flooding from the Grimsvart Lake. Grimsvart is an ice damped lake underneath the ice. The water in the lake is heated by volcanic and geothermal activity at the bottom of the lake. There's automatic monitoring equipment in this hut on top of the cliff to monitor the volcano underneath the water. These shots are from the eruption I filmed in this lake three years earlier in May 1983. The water from the Grimsvart Lake forces its way underneath the glacier to the big sands in the south. The countryside here was given its name Öræfi, the wastelands, after a big eruption in the glacier in the year 1362. to be the most isolated place in Iceland. This bridge completed in 1974 has made this region more accessible. In the eruption in the year 1362, farms were wiped away by the huge flow of water and icebergs. The farms are no longer built on the sands, but in the hills above.
At the beginning of a glacier burst, there's always a terrible smell of sulfur coming from the glacier. The first person to smell the beginning of a glacier burst used to be the farmer Ragnar Stefansson at the farm Skaftafell. I always wanted to capture his famous nose on film, and I finally succeeded. At the end of a glacier burst, the ice on top of the Grimsvart Lake has sunk a hundred meters. Smoke was coming from underneath the ice in the same place as where it erupted in May 1983. There was some speculation among the scientists that the new eruption was beginning. As I was flying back to Reykjavik, I noticed the water was starting to escape from a nearby ice-damped glacier lake, Grænalón. Another glacier burst was starting. Normally, the water stays underneath the glacier until it reaches the sands below. But in this case, the water resurfaced and was flowing on top of the glacier down to the sands below. Glacier bursts are the most frequent in Iceland. International scientists often use the Icelandic word for it, Jökulhaup. In 1987, there had not been a crater opening for three years by Lake Mivat in North Iceland. The magma chamber, three kilometers underneath the ground and going down to seven, was now filling faster than it had for a long time. In eight months, the ground had been lifted nine centimeters. Magma is what the scientists call the lava before it comes to the surface and lets out gases. A crater could open any time. Farmer Manni also operates the seismographs and the tildometers. The ground rising on top of the magma chamber was continuing, but no immediate reason for alarm, so I decided to get away for a while. For us, the turning point of the eruptions was the 10th of July, 1980. The time is 1.30 in the afternoon. The ground opened half an hour ago. The crack is six kilometer long. The lava is all flowing to the north, away from the settlement. The lava must be going around 150 meters up into the air. It's unbelievable to see. The whole ground is on the move. The lava speeds must be around 30 meters per second or even faster. Never seen anything like it. 
to the north, the lava is like all disappearing back into the ground again somehow. I don't know how this is possible. The crack here is 500 meters long and the size of the flow is not changing. The lava is just going back into the ground. I had a cameraman down there somewhere. I was just hoping he was feeling okay at this point. The cameraman on the ground had only reached the smallest crater, the one closest to the settlement, close to the beginning of the eruption. It's a fairly small crater and you can walk quite close to it, about 10 meters. But as always, you have to keep watching the wind direction. Below this crater is a beautiful lava pool. We are not sure if there's a crater underneath this pool or if it's just the gases coming out. We are about 10 meters away and the action is four meters from side to side and we're not sure what kind of splashes are coming out. We've been on alert for these eruptions now for four and a half years and the longest eruption in four and a half years had only lasted four hours and we're hoping this eruption is going to continue. We have a problem here getting quickly from the east side to the west side and in one crazy place you could actually cross but it was so warm underneath you had to keep walking if you stopped it just got too warm. The gentleman you're watching is the famous Icelandic geologist Sigurdur Thoransson. He worked with my father since the Hekla eruption 47 to 48 and did the commentary from all of our volcano films. The eruption in July 1980 by Lake Mivat lasted for eight days from July the 10th till July the 18th and for us it was a turning point of the eruptions we've been covering at that point for four and a half years. Early July 1988, there was a big increase in the earthquake and ground rising activities by Lake Miva. A decision was made to close off the Leiduka mountain on top of the magma chamber and make it off limits to everyone. A sign was put up in four languages saying that this was a very dangerous place and we should not be here. Before that sign was the tourists did not know where to go. Now everyone flocked to the rear, waiting for things to happen. The ground had never been lifted higher. The three kilometer deep magma chamber had never been fuller. The scientists wanted to close off the whole area, including the town. If some water underground hit the magma chamber, there could easily be something like an atomic explosion, with the effect that many of the tourists would get a free flight back to their home country. The local tourist committee was not too keen on closing down. They have a very short tourist season and thought it wise to risk having a few of the tourists literally taking off. It was the autumn of 1988. I was determined to make my way again to the countryside in the south, Öræfi, the wastelands, and possibly climb onto the highest point in Iceland, Kvandalsnjúkur which is 2,119 meters high. But it was far too windy, so I waited at the campsite in Skaftafell, where the weather wouldn't change. The farmer in Skaftafell, Jakob. When I was younger, I worked one summer on Jakob's farm, birthday in Skaftafell. I have some nice memories from this place. I went with my friends up to the famous waterfall in the hill about the Skaftafell farm. It's called Svartifoss, the Black Waterfall. I drove with my friends out to Ingolfs Höfði, Ingolfs Head, named after the first settler in Iceland, Ingolfur Arnarsson.
Ingolu stayed here the first winter. He then found a bay with hot springs, Reykjavik. Further along the coast is Jogosalon, the Glacier River Lagoon. My father made a documentary film of this countryside in the 50s. This is me riding an Icelandic horse into the picturesque Mosodalur Valley by Skaftafell. I was to help my father finish that film a few years later. Here there are violent streams of ice cold water, says an ancient book about Iceland. And nowhere do these words apply better than in Uraivi. Once, if a man wished to cross the glacial rivers, he had nothing to rely on but his horse. Now tractors and cars have taken the place of horses, and one river after another has been bridged. Here, in isolation, Old ways that had died out in most other places still survived. On the cliffs, guillemots and fulmots were found and on the crest, puffins, sometimes netted by the people of neighboring farms. Seabirds are not the only perquisite of the people of Uraivi. Sea trout makes a welcome addition to the larder on many farms, while seals breed widely along the sands and swim up the river estuaries. Once in the net, their lives are not spared, though they gaze with reproachful human eyes at those who seek to kill them. It is now Sunday, and churchgoers are on their way to church at Hof, where there is a confirmation today. Women riding side saddle will soon be a rare sight in Iceland, but the style goes well with the national costume. I headed for the Aska Central Volcano south of Lake Mivat, where there had been an eruption in 1961. The lake, 217 meters deep, was formed by huge ground movements in the caldera during the eruption here in 1875. There are many craters in the Aska caldera, and in the middle of the lake, there's a little island. The explosive crater Vite, which means hell, was formed in the eruption 1875. I landed by Lake Mivat, rented a jeep and headed for Aska. This time I was not driving the old Willis jeep, but a red Russian one. The weather looked too good to be true. It can change very quickly in this place. Three years before, in 1985, in the same place, I had to leave my Jeep behind because of large snowdrifts and hitchhike a ride with a group of tourists in a bus. We arrived at the Traveler's Hut in Aska by Dregagil, the Dragon's Gorge.
We drove over the lava flows from the 1961 eruption and up to the craters Vikraporkir. From there, we walked up to the explosive crater Vite. It was the kind of trip you find exciting only afterwards. The water in the crater is warm and popular for bathing, but not in this kind of weather. But on my trip now in September 1988, three years later, I had no better luck. It was all fog. There was no point in staying any longer as the weather forecast was continuous fog. Here, the smoking edge of the lava flow can be seen more than five miles from its source. It advances here in the form of block lava, similar to that of the 1947 Hecla eruption. Scoria and lumps of hardened lava tumble constantly from its edge. But underneath, there is a glowing river of viscous pumice that creeps slowly forward. And now we see the craters on the eruption fissure that runs from east to west a short way to the south of Eskjaup. They have already built up cones about them from cinders and lumps of lava. And from them, columns of glowing molten lava are thrown up. In scientific circles, these are called lava fountains and are best known from the eruptions in Hawaii. From these fiery columns, some of the ash and cinders falls back on the cones, continually enlarging them, while to the north of the crater runs a swiftly moving river of lava that has broken a gap in the wall. Here we get a good view of the lava gushing forth. To most, the first sight of the glowing edge of the lava is an unforgettable one. It is pleasant to stand at a suitable distance from it and enjoy the heat while you watch the ever-changing front as large fragments break from the glowing face. The craters are veiled in a haze of smoke and vapor but can be dimly seen. The lava fountains have almost stopped now and the eruption from the craters is of the kind associated with Stromboli. The summer of 1988 was coming to an end. The earthquakes by Lake Mivat had slowed down. I still had a cameraman on standby on the ground. I decided to return to Reykjavik once more. This must be the last tourist of the summer in Mivat. A Swedish girl trying to hitchhike to the east to work in a fish factory. But unfortunately, Gudrun from Reykjavik was not going any further. On the way back to Reykjavik, I flew over the Jökulsá Gljúfur, the Glacier River Canyon. Dattifoss, the tumbling waterfall. Erdöbreith is a table mountain formed by an eruption under a glacier. The Aska Caldera. Snæfell, the snow mountain. In the distance, the Vatnajökull glacier, the water glacier. 
In 1988, it was 25 years since the island of Sutsay erupted out of the sea. I joined an expedition to build a new hut for the scientists on the island. It was hard to believe this island was only a quarter of a century old. When the eruption started in 1963, I was 19 years old and I went out filming immediately with my father. It was the first eruption I was involved in. On the morning of the 14th of November, 1963, a submarine eruption started southwest of Hema'e, where the sea was formerly 140 meters deep and an island was born later to be named Sertse. The new volcanic island took first the form of a ridge, but within a fortnight, it had become almost round, about 800 meters across and over 100 meters high, formed entirely of volcanic ash and lumps of lava. The crater was open to the south and sea flooded into it. Now, in 1988, the island was found rising out of the sea in one year, eight centimeters. There were new cracks by the old craters. The surface temperature in places was up to 287 degrees Celsius, and red-hot lava was only 200 meters underneath the surface. The island has always been off limits to everyone, except for the scientists as it is being preserved for the studying of colonization of the various forms of life. Iceland itself is built up in the same way as Sutsay by a series of submarine eruptions. Another remarkable eruption was on the island of Hemai in 1973. A 1.6 kilometer long fissure opened up only 200 meters southeast of Iceland's most important fishing center, the town of Vespanea. Within a few hours, about 5,000 people had been successfully evacuated, but some 300 were left behind to take up the fight against the new volcano. It was a heroic and unexpectedly successful fight, which lasted until one third of the town had been completely buried beneath tephra and lava, but the harbor remained intact securing the future of the town.
In 1989, things were quiet in the Lake Mivat area. The ground on top of the magma chamber was on the rise. I was there waiting. The tourists were hoping that the eruption would begin, preferably when they were right there. And when the magma chamber is full, like now, the ground on top has been lifted more than one meter. The town itself, 10 kilometers down, has been lifted more than half a meter, and the bottom of the lake is coming up of the same reason. But it's a strange thing. The subject is almost taboo. Nobody tells you anything when you're actually there. On a volcanic fissure which cuts through the town, there's a popular bathing cave, Storagau, the big cave. Icelanders and tourists alike customarily bathe here in the news. Twelve years before, in 1977, lava had flowed underground south out of the magma chamber into this fissure and others by the town. The town itself, that day alone, was lifted 30 centimeters, and the mountain I'm standing on moved 2.1 meters away. Geological occurrences like this are happening all the time on this island. Near Mount Hekla in the Landmalaugar hot spring area, there were low-frequency earthquakes. It often means that the lava is on its way to the surface. Landmalaugar, a four-hour drive from Reykjavik, is a place many of the tourists miss. From Landmannalöga, there are many interesting walking routes. The most popular walk from Landmannalöga is a four-day trek to a valley in the south. As always, when traveling in Iceland, you have to be prepared for any kind of weather. And you have to be very careful crossing the rivers. Thosmörk, the Valley of the Gods. Small steam clouds kept coming out of Mount Hekla. I kept flying over the mountain or went walking there. Something was bound to happen. The Hekla eruption in 1947-48 had lasted 13 months. The documentary my father made of this eruption was his first film. It was just after the Second World War, and people seemed to be taking a lot of risks up at the craters to somehow prove themselves. In the 13 months the eruption lasted, 800 million cubic meters of lava came out of the mountain.
The Hecla eruption 1970 was different. The craters were not in the mountain itself, but all around it. In places, you could drive quite close to the craters and the advancing lava streams. At times, a driver would have a narrow escape with his car. The eruption lasted two months. The Hecla eruption in August 1980 was very unexpected. I was on the way up to the mountain to film when all of a sudden the eruption started. In only 13 hours, 180 million cubic meters of lava came out of the mountain. The eruption lasted three days. A few months later, there was another brief outburst, but finally, my wait was over. Early morning, the 17th of January 1991, most Icelanders were busy following the beginning of the war in the Middle East on live radio and television. In the evening the same day, January 17th, 1991, the eruption in Mount Hecla I had been waiting for finally started. After a few hours, no craters were visible in the western slopes of the mountain, but a crater in the eastern slopes continued. As in the eruption on the island of Heimai, it was difficult to get to the fast-moving lava streams because they were so far into the slow-moving flows. Little by little, the activity in the eastern crater diminished. And the lava started to flow from underneath the crater. The volume of lava was estimated at 150 million cubic meters, and the area it covered was 23 square kilometers. The eruption lasted 53 days. I will now show you a few scenes from my forthcoming film on the Vatnajökull glacier volcano in South Iceland. This is Tuesday, October 1st, 1996. According to the scientist, an eruption has already started underneath the 600 meter thick ice, 10 kilometer north of the Grimsvet Lake. The second day of the eruption, Wednesday, October 2nd, the first eruption cloud manages to break through the 600 meter thick ice and rises to a height of three kilometers. The third day of the eruption, Thursday, October 3rd. The melting water from the volcano seems to be flowing underneath the ice to the south in direction of the Grimsvet Lake. I made a terrible mistake. I accidentally turned off the motor in the plane while flying over the site of the eruption. The pilot nervously tried to restart the plane while I was looking for a good landing spot. He asked me never to do that again. Monday, October 14, all earthquake activity in the glacier has stopped.
Here we are landing on the island formed in the ice at the end of the eruption. The water from the eruption site keeps flowing south into the ice dam Grimsert Lake, 10 km away, at a rate of 5,000 cubic meters per second. The scientists are wondering why the water has not already burst onto the sands in the south. According to a possible disaster scenario now, the water volume in the rivers might increase a hundred times. In order to lead the flood water away from the four bridges, many cuts are made in the 30 kilometer long road and filled with sand. The roads over the sands are closed from 8 o'clock at night till 8 in the morning due to the imminent threat of a huge glacier burst. The evening of November 4, the scientists are describing the situation on the glacier as very lively. There are many earthquakes. Nobody knows for sure if this is the beginning of the glacier burst or still another crater opening underneath the ice. Early morning, November 5th. I'm in a plane flying over the Grimsert Lake to see if I can see something happening. We are flying over the threshold east of the cliff. We hear over the radio that the flooding is beginning down on the sands. We decide to fly down there immediately. from under the glacier is absolutely unbelievable. In all the panic, I switched off the motor in the plane again. The pilot is not so nervous this time while restarting the motor. Midday, the Skedero River Bridge, 900 meters long, still intact. The bridge over the River Gia is starting to break apart. Everybody thought that the small bridge over the Silohusakis River would be the first to go, but it's still standing. Three hundred meters of the nine hundred meter long Skedero River Bridge have disappeared. surprise the glacier burst lasted only one day. Outside the south coast there was a 30 square kilometer dark spot resulting from the flooding. November 7th in the morning I made a flight over the Grimsworth Lake to film. At the end of the cliff a huge ice canyon was forming. It was about six kilometer long and two kilometer wide. This was the way the water flowed from the Grimsworth Lake down to the sands. In 1997, there were a lot of earthquakes in the glacier and a new eruption was expected west of the Grimsworth Lake. One of the largest hotspots on this planet is underneath this area. It has a diameter of 200 kilometer and is 650 kilometer deep. In the summer of 1997, a 30-kilometer long road over the sands below the glacier was open again. A lot of quicksand was forming where the icebergs were melting. The new eruption I was expecting west of the Grimsworth Lake finally happened middle of August, but unfortunately nothing came through the ice, but I'm still waiting. 